All right, let's take our course books, turn to page 10, Psalm number three. Sing this to the tune of the old rugged cross, but it's the battle of the Christ of the cross. Page 10. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. It was on the old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the Till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross, and I'll praise him in glory that day. The Christ of the cross, so despised by the world, as a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory alone to bear sin on dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the Christ of the Till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross. And I'll praise him in glory that day. On the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. It was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross and I'll praise him in glory that day. To the Christ of the cross, I will ever be true. His shame and reproach gladly bear. Then he'll call me someday, for by his grace I am saved. And his glory forever I'll share. So I'll cherish the Christ of the cross. Till his trophies at last he brings home. I will cling to the Christ of the cross. And I'll praise him in glory that day. Amen. All right. Robert's going to come and read for us. Psalm 14. The reading of the Lord's word. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are all corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that do it good. Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand to seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, 
No, not one. Of all the workers of iniquity, no knowledge. Who eat, who eat up my people as they eat bread, and call it not upon the Lord. There were they in great fear, for God is in the generation of the righteous. Ye have shamed the counsel of the poor, because the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel were come out of Zion, when the Lord bringeth back the captivity of his people. Jacob shall rejoice, and Israel shall be glad. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now, and we thank you, Lord, today for this word, because it should touch all of our lives, because we were those people that there was no God at one time, but now we see the true living God through the word. Father, we thank you today. We pray that you be with Brother Kim and be with those that are sick today and heal them to do thy will. We look to you today, Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. All right, let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we'll sing this hymn to the tune of Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. Lord, we met to see thy beauty and to worship at thy feet. May we ask to see more clearly. Grace and glory, rich and sweet, tell us more of Christ our Savior, in Him all thy people bless. Let us dwell with Thee forever, in the Lord our righteousness. Christ our light and our salvation, God is just to justify. By his merits we're forgiven, God is gracious, is our cry. Confidence in God our Savior, Free to serve and worship now. We shall reign with Christ in glory at the throne of grace we now. All right, Bob's coming to read. Good morning. Please turn with me to Matthew chapter 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around about Jordan, and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you, that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. 
I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes am I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan and to John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. Comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. May we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. The scriptures that we read, dear Lord, proclaim the righteousness, dear Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the complete fulfillment of the Father. Thank you again that you would open our eyes to see and ears to hear the words proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 172. We'll stand and sing this together. Think about the words, O Word of God incarnate, 172.
right, Mike is going to come down and read for us. Reading from John 10, 32 to 42. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I shewed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy. And because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him, whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. And many believed on him there. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the privilege to gather together to hear your word preached. We are seeking to see the Lord Christ and to hear the word of the gospel. Lord, we ask that you take us into your mind and give us, fill our hearts with the jewels of Christ, the true treasure, the salvation. Lord, we ask that you bless the preaching of your word this morning. In Jesus' name. Well, I've entitled this message simply, Jesus as the Son of God. Some of us may think, well, what's the big deal? We've known that for some time. Yet, when you consider, as long as the scriptures have been written, and we hold them in our hands, yet the majority of the world still does not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I sat down and started looking through some of the known religions of our day. Take the Jews, for example these that were standing here before Christ in his day and denounced him for declaring that he was the Son of God. You go over to Israel today, it's still the same thing. They do not believe that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. In fact, if you even bring up the subject with them, they'll be just as irate with you as they were with the Lord Jesus Christ. Then consider the Muslim world. How many Muslims there are in the world. I remember talking to a Muslim one time and pointing him to Christ as the Son of God, and he said to me, he said, I can see the devil around your lips for declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. You think about Hindu. They don't believe he's the Son of God. They hold to him being a God, little G-O-D, like others, but not the Son of God. Buddhists, Chinese, what they call themselves as Jehovah Witnesses, they really aren't. Because true witnesses of Jehovah would be those that own him and declare him to be Jehovah, the great I am. And then you think about the number of secular religions, animists and agnostics, but I dare say that even in the world, many that call themselves Christian, when you come right down to it, they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God. They hold him to be God, so they say, and yet when you hear them talking, it's just like their buddy. He would like to do a lot of things, but can't unless man lets him. Not even they, and I'm talking about now all those that hold to a so-called free will religion, do not believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I know some will get offended and say, oh, no, I, I believe he is. Well, why do you treat and act, treat him and act as if he isn't? Because if he's the Son of God, then all power is in his hands. Even as he prayed there in the, in the garden, he thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh that he might 
give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. You see, this all starts with the Father and the Son. We saw that already last time in John 10 and verse 30. He said, I and my Father are one. What he's declaring is what we know of God. If we know anything of God, it's going to be through the Son. I know people get upset. I had a preacher say that to me one time. You mean to tell me when I'm in the airplane flying over this whole world and I look down and see all of those populations down below that they're not all God's children? No. The Lord has his children among the populace of the world, but they're not all his children. And that is an offensive statement to so many today that think that God's like a grandfather sitting on a rocking chair on his porch, you know, and kids mess up, grandkids, and he just kind of says, okay, settle down, children, settle down. But in the end, everybody's going to be saved. That's not what the scriptures teach. And when you begin to declare the testimony of scripture of who Christ is, you're not talking about a namby pandy Jesus out there being preached, but a sovereign Lord Jesus who's none other than God himself in the flesh. He came, lived, died, and rose again and ascended on high. Where he ever lives to intercede right now on behalf of those that the Father gave him through this work of salvation between the Father and the Son. That's where the work was done. And the Jews hearing that, just like people today hearing this, exclusive message of Christ and salvation in him alone, the reaction is still the same today. It says there, verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. They would rather be rid of this Jesus and go about their way in their unbelief and rebellion than to bow. And that's really what is the issue today, even among so many that call themselves Christian. And if you don't believe it, bring up the conversation at a table with people that profess to be Christians and ask them the question, who does the saving? Is it the Lord Jesus? that saves, or is it cooperation between man and Jesus? You'll hear people say, well, he died on the cross for every sin except for unbelief. Well, if he didn't die for unbelief, then the greatest sin of all was left without a ransom. Now, he died for every sin, but he died for every sin of those that the Father gave him. It's not every sin of every single sinner. And there again, you want to start a fight at a dinner table, just bring that up. Ask the question, are there any in hell for whom Christ died? People believe there are. Yeah, he came, but you know, men don't believe, and so alas, God has to send them to hell. That's not the Christ of Scripture. So I want us to understand what it is for the Lord Jesus to be none other than the Son of God. Because that's what this portion of Scripture is. And first of all, Three simple points here. First of all, we have the testimony of Christ himself. I don't know why you'd need any other testimony than that. But that's what we have there in verses 30 down to verse 33. This is Christ testifying himself. Here he is, the creator of the world, standing before these very creatures that he himself is giving life to, even though they're rebels. And he doesn't Cast them into hell. He doesn't cause fire to come out of heaven and destroy them. And here they are standing before this one who's not only the creator, but the sovereign, the ruler, the one in whose hands is all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. You know, in other areas of life, if I were to tell you that there's one person in the world that can give you a million dollars, but he's already chosen who he's going to give it to. Would you just kind of sit back and think, oh, well, he's already chosen and I'm not interested? I guarantee you, you'd be probably pounding at the door to find out I'm not one of those. But when it comes to salvation and you declare that God has already determined ahead of time who it is that he'll save and who it is he'll condemn, people go, Phew. What's the, what's the use then? 
I tell you, this is a vital interest to me. If he is indeed as he says he is, and he is the Son of God, and all salvation is in his hands, and I'm that sinner that knows that he has the right either to save me or condemn me, I'm interested. I'm at his door. Am I one of those that you purpose to say for whom you came and shed your blood? But I know that none can be interested unless the Spirit draws them. And that's really what the issue is here. But the testimony of Christ himself, when he says up there in verse 30, I and my Father are one. This is a very significant statement, declaration of the Lord Jesus Christ about him being God. And again, it's a mystery. Scriptures speak of the Godhead. There's the Father, there's the Son, and the Spirit. The three are one, but not the same person. There was a Father. When, when Christ was praying to the Father, he was praying to the Father. He wasn't praying to himself. There are, in our day, those that call themselves Jesus only. And it sounds good on the surface, but what they really mean is Jesus only. There's not a Father, there's not a Son, and there's not the Spirit. They're all one. Just he manifests himself sometimes as the Father, sometimes as the Son, sometimes as the Spirit. That's not what the Scriptures are saying. Here, when it says are one, I and the Father are one, that means the Father and the Son are equal in their nature in their essence as to who they truly are. In other words, God himself. That's why the Lord told his disciples a little later on in our study here in John, John 14, when they asked, show us the Father and suffice it. That was Philip. And he said, how long have I been so long time with you, Philip, that you've not known me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. How sayest thou then, show us the Father? And I truly believe that when we get to glory, there's going to be one person seated upon that throne. Yes, there's the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but that honor, the Father, his purpose from eternity should go to the Son. And that's why if he manifests himself to any sinner, it's going to be through the Son. And so that's Christ's testimony here when he says, it says that, when they took up stones to stone in verse 32, Jesus answered them. Do we really need any other witness than Christ himself as to who he says he is? Isn't that what it is to believe on Christ? Is to believe his word? Is to believe how he has manifested himself through his word? He says to them, many good works have I showed you from my father. What he's declaring there is his work on this earth in coming was for the glory of the Father. He didn't come down here to try to gather a crowd or be popular. He wasn't up for election. That's how he's presented today, as if he's running for office. If he wants to be the king of your life, won't you please let him in? That's not the Christ of Scripture. When he says, many good works have I showed you from my Father, what's a good work? It's that which is produced by Christ himself to the glory and honor of the Father. That's the simple definition here. And so the good works, you might say, well, that's his miracles that he did, yes. He didn't just go around doing miracles just to do miracles. Every miracle had a purpose according to what we read here, that it was from his father. It was that men might know these works that he did, might know that he was indeed that Messiah, that anointed one. That's what the word Messiah means, that sent one of the father. And so he puts the question back on them like a good attorney might do. Here's Christ speaking on his behalf. So for which of those works do ye stone me? That's a good question. Well, here it is again. They weren't upset about the good works he was doing, just like so many today. They don't mind you going around talking about the miracles Christ did and all the good that he did for society. 
That's not the issue. That's not what's an offense. What's an offense is what the Lord drew out of these Jews in answering him. Verse 33, the Jews answered him saying, for a good work we stone thee not. You're not going to get in trouble preaching the miracles that Christ did. People will come and hear that kind of Jesus and they'll even go away thinking, oh, if he could just continue to do these kind of miracles. And that's why preachers organize these prayer meetings. They want, you want to see the power of this Jesus? You come and bring your requests and you're going to see the mighty hand of this Jesus working. They promote him before men as being somebody that's like a genie in a bottle. You can just rub the bottle up and out pops a genie. If you can just pray long enough and hard enough and get enough people doing it, you're going to see this same Jesus today going around doing these good works. You'll never have anybody that's going to throw you out for that. But here was the issue. And notice all these works, again, as I said, were done by the Father's direction. Because he says there, I, have I showed you from my Father? There was never a time that the Son ever did anything but what the Father was directing, or that the Spirit was directing. See, the honor and glory was from the Father to the Son. You see that particularly back here in John chapter 5. In verse 19, you say, why were they so upset with him? This wasn't the first time. This wasn't the first meeting. He said in verse 17 of John 5, or go back to verse 16, therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus. That word persecute means to pursue unto death. They wanted to be rid of him and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Here again, it wasn't that he had healed somebody, but that he did it on their Sabbath day, and they considered healing to be a work. And so they sought to kill him for doing that work. Well, why did he do that work on that Sabbath day? To show that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. There it is, setting himself forth. And Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Now, what was the reaction there? Verse 18, Therefore the Jews sought to kill him, sought the more to kill him, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also the Son likewise. You see that harmony? That's the beauty of Christ as he set forth as the Son of God. He's just not on an adventure out here trying to get as many people to trust in him as, as he can. No, he's come according to the Father's purpose. The greatest work he ever did to the glory of the Father was when he laid down his life. That God might be just and declare righteous those sinners for whom he died. He didn't lay down his life as an offering to men. That's how this Jesus is preached today. Well, he laid down his life. Now he's being offered to you. What are you going to do with that? You won't find that anywhere in Scripture. He laid down his life an offering to his Father. And all of the relationship is between him and the Father. And that's why there were good works. That word good in English comes from the word God. They were God works. And uh, they're God's works because they were an act of obedience to the Father. And as a result, a blessing to those he came to say. But this was the bone of contention. Again, Christ's own testimony. The same is true today when you set it forth just as clearly as what it is here in Scripture. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. We don't have an idea of just how much hatred there is in men's hearts toward the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. It's there. It just doesn't manifest itself all the time because people get dressed up and get in their vehicles and 
They go to their places of worship. They'll sing even some of the hymns we sing. And they'll mention the name of Jesus. All of these things, but they've never been confronted by the true Lord Jesus Christ. That's why they go where they go, because they want to hear of a Jesus that is their equal. Had, had Christ just simply told these, well, I'm your equal. This is your rabbi, I'm a rabbi. This is your sons of God, I'm the son of God. If he had reasoned that way, wouldn't, there wouldn't have been a fight. And that's what they wanted. People like a Jesus that is in their hands and that they can communicate with and he will listen to them and work alongside of them, cooperate with them. That's the Jesus of our generation, our day, but it's not the Christ Jesus of Scripture. Here they took up stones again to stone him. Here the religious leaders considered that that statement made up there in verse 30, not the first time he'd said it, I and the Father are one, was a blasphemy. That's a strong word. Here they are telling the Lord Jesus Christ that he was a blasphemer. How blind were they not seeing themselves as being the true blasphemers? But to be blasphemed, for them, shows that they were not only ignorant, but they were rebels. That Greek word, when it says that they took up stones again to stone him, literally, if you can picture this, they were running around looking for stones, finding some big enough that would hurt. That's what it means there. They fetched stones to start flinging at him. It's clear at that point that they lost the argument, had they? As they say in court, if you don't have any facts to defend the case, then start attacking the character. And that's really what they were seeking to do here with the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said very plainly, you know, some people say, well, if he said he was the Son of God, was he really saying he was God? They understood what it meant. They said that in verse 33, because that thou... Being a man, makest thyself God. He didn't say makest thyself like God. They understood. And I will tell you that when Christ was testifying of himself, he wasn't just saying he was like a God, but he was God. And that's the mystery of Godliness, isn't it? That God became flesh. Great is the mystery of Godliness. God became flesh and dwelt among men. He's not, here it's not saying he's making himself God. But that's not how they understood his testimony when it says thou makest thyself God. It wasn't just that that's your testimony. No, what he is declaring that is that he is God. And that's his testimony. That's the testimony that he the only he could give because he knew who he was as God's son. The second, there's three witnesses here. There's the witness of Christ as to him being the son of God. But secondly, there's the witness or the testimony of the scriptures. Here's Christ who is the word of God. And yet when he argues with Men, and I say argue not in a sense like we argue, but brings forth his argument in defense of who he is, he goes nowhere else but to Scripture. And I will tell you that if today I believe that Jesus is the Son of God, none other than God in the flesh, it's not because I've been able to reason this out of my mind logically, how he could be at the same time, God and man, but it's because of what the scriptures declare and the spirit of God opening my eyes to cause me to see what the scriptures declare. And that's where we see in verses 34 through 39, our Lord here goes back to the scriptures and actually he's reasoning from Psalm 82. 
If you want to know whether the scriptures point to Christ, just read the scriptures. In the early century, the only scriptures that Christ used were the Old Testament scriptures. The only scriptures the apostle used, the apostles used as they went around preaching Christ was from the Old Testament. And even after his resurrection in Luke 24, Christ said that beginning with Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, he declared unto them the sufferings that he should suffer. So here, when Jesus answered them, notice, is it not written in your law? I said, ye are God's, little G-O-D-S. Let's go back there to Psalm 82. This was the scripture, and you have to remember, Christ wasn't walking around with a scroll of scriptures under his arm. Like we have our Bibles, and we've got a concordance, and we can kind of check out scriptures. He quoted these scriptures from memory and from heart. Why? Because he is the author. He knows what it is that he caused David to write, but it's all about him. And here it is in Psalm 82, this very scripture that he is declaring here particularly in verse 6 as you read on down through this Psalm 82. You just start at the beginning and see how this all develops. No scripture was ever quoted by Christ out of context. Every scripture pertained to him. Those quote out of context of scriptures who don't point sinners to Christ. But here God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods, little g-o-d-s. That word in the Old Testament for gods was actually a word used for the princes and the leaders of the day. It's like we have different nations today who they consider their leaders to be gods, as God. And so this goes all the way back in time. And the reason is because these were men that were established in authority over the people, and so were God's representatives. So they, they looked upon them as God's representative. And this is exactly Christ's argument with these Pharisees. Why would you not have a problem with what the scriptures declare that these rulers and princes were gods and yet now I come declaring myself to be God, not a God, but God, one with the Father, and all of a sudden now you, you're upset. How long will ye judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? See here, Christ stands in contrast of judges, and we could put even their religious leaders that judge unjustly how they accept the persons of the wicked. Were Christ not truly the Son of God standing before these Jewish religious leaders, he might have been tempted to try to find some common ground, like so many try to do. Let's see if we can't get along. But here it says, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the person of the week? Had Christ changed his view just to get along, he would not have been the son of God. He said, defend the poor and fatherless, do justice to the afflicted and needy. Is that not what Christ came to do? Were that were those not the works that he came to accomplish for the poor, the needy, the fatherless? All of this is descriptive of sinners in need. And Christ having compassion upon them. These Jews that Christ stood before had no such compassion. In fact, they would fleece the sheep instead of feeding the sheep. To deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked. They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness, all the foundation of the earth are out, out of course. That's describing man in the fall. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. So there's the scripture 
that our Lord goes back to, to these. They didn't have any problem with that scripture. When they read it, they kind of read it boastfully. Yeah, that's who we are. We're, we're gods. And that's really how they saw themselves in their hierarchy. Just like in religion today, you've got preachers standing up there in garbs, and uh, they're separated from the people, and they want people to look on them as God. That's truly their thought. Here in the scriptures, he said, I have said to your gods, and all of you are children of the Most High, but ye shall die like men, and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge of the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. Well, that's how the Lord here is answering these, right from the very scripture that they had. They had no problem with calling each other gods. But when he declared that he was none other than the son of the living God, now all of a sudden, they were saying he was blaspheming. And uh, here, the picture is, because remember in John 10, I said the ones that he's speaking to here are the Jews. You go back to verse 24. Then came the Jews round about him. Nothing has changed here. Here's our Lord standing there in their midst. They're squeezing in around him. They've come to take him and to kill him if they could. And so now they held those rocks that they had gathered and would have stoned him to death were it not that God had purposed that his son not die by stone. There was a way that he was going to die, but it wasn't in men's hands. It would be according to what God has purposed, and that would be at the cross. But what we see here, again, Christ using the testimony of scriptures, but not flinching. And neither should we flinch when it comes to declaring who the Lord Jesus Christ is. I'm so tired of the namby-pamby preachers you run into that tell you, well, you know, you're saying a whole lot plainer than I could, ever could, even though the scriptures clearly declare it. Well, then get out of the pulpit. Go find something to do. Go work on water pipes that are breaking or fix motors or do something, but don't stand there as if you represent almighty God and you, because of the anger of those that hear you somehow, now you're going to you're going to wither. Our Lord didn't wither. Uh, the picture here is they've got him surrounded. They thought they had him and yet he never wavered. What did he do? He went back to the scriptures as his testimony, this very word of God. And there's an example for us. Where do we turn when men become offended or want to question why it is that we declare God, we declare Christ for who he is? Well, what say of the scriptures? Why not say to somebody, is it not written in your scriptures? When you talk about God and his sovereignty, you don't have to go out and get a book and hand it to somebody to prove God's sovereignty. Let's go here and read Romans 9 together a little bit. See what God says about his son. Let's go over there to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's just read what God testifies himself of his son in salvation. And uh, if you say you believe the Bible, because there are a lot of people out there that say they believe the Bible is God's word. The problem is they just don't believe God, the God of the Bible. Or they'll hold it tenaciously. Yeah, this is God's word. But what saith the scriptures? That's where our Lord Jesus Christ took these to demonstrate that he was none other than the sovereign Lord God. He says that in verse 35. See his reason after quoting Psalm 82 6. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and what the scripture cannot be broken. You believe this is the inspired word of God? No. What does it say? Because the word cannot be broken. Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified. Well, there again, it shows us that all of scripture has one purpose, and that is to sanctify the Lord Jesus Christ, to exalt him as prophet, priest, and king. No matter where you turn, it's all about him. Say ye of him 
whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest because I said, I am the Son of God. Save hold of the scriptures. He goes to the scriptures to prove why it is that he is indeed the Son of God in contrast to all these others that they call gods. And yet, they would not hear him. So that's the deeper aim of this argument of our Lord Jesus Christ to show them that the whole concept of man and God being one, that's really what the issue was here. How can you say you being a man make yourself to be God? Well, what do you say about your leaders? They're men, and yet they hold that title as God's little G-O-D-S. So you can see how it is our Lord is showing them how far removed they are from the truth. And yet he says here, and this is, this is why all testimony if you ask me, why do you believe, Ken, that Jesus is the Son of God and that he is who he says he is? What saith the scriptures? Here's pretty clear, isn't it? The scriptures cannot be broken. Men's words are broken. Don't take a man's word for it. That's the number one problem with people when you start preaching a Christ they've never heard. They've heard of a Jesus, but they've never heard of this Lord Jesus Christ. And when they begin to hear, what's the first thing you want to do? They want to run and ask the pastor. Let me go talk to your, my pastor about that. I recently had somebody that I was talking to about God's sovereignty and about Christ coming and paying the sin debt of that people that the Father gave him. And he told me that. He said, well, I'm going to go talk to my pastor about it. And I told him immediately, he said, if you do, you're in trouble. But guess what? He went and talked to his pastor. Next time I saw him, you know what he said? My pastor says, you're a Calvinist. And I said, did I ever mention the word Calvin? In fact, last time I checked in the concordance, I've never found the word Calvin. The word Christian, you know what that word means? One who belongs to Christ. That's who I am, and I boldly stand by it. I don't know Calvin. I've never read his works. I've read bits and pieces of it because people... To point out, but that's that's not my Christ. But that's where people get in trouble. I'll tell you, the word cannot be broken. The scripture cannot be broken. And if God is going to do a work of grace in the heart, it's going to be through this scripture. That's where we stand, right along with our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the author and finisher of faith. So this is the truth with regard to the scripture. When it says it cannot be broken, I know men try to take the scriptures and pervert it, and that's their problem. They do so to their own condemnation. I'll tell you, as we come to the scripture, let us ask God to open our spirit to see, and as even Brother Mike prayed, I love to enter into the very mind of God. Because that's the spirit's work to do. Even as I declaring to you Christ the Son of God. And notice I haven't stood up here and tried to go down through 10, 12 different points to prove that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. All I have to declare is what saith the Scripture. Christ's testimony, testimony of Scripture. The word there when he says cannot be broken, the Scripture cannot be made void. It cannot be set aside because of inconvenience just doesn't seem to fit how I, and that's where people get in trouble when they say, well, I think, there's your problem right there. Quit thinking. Start bowing. What saith the scripture? What is written remains written. So the word of God cannot be broken. Men will try to take it. They'll try to twist it. They'll try to formulate another view of God but Christ. But here, you can't change what God has purpose to do with his son, verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified. Why was he sanctified? Why was he set apart? Why did he come into this world to actually save, not to try to save, but to save by his righteous life? He earned and established that righteousness necessary to the satisfaction of a holy God. And when he laid down his life, he 
pay the ransom price. And he cried, it is finished, it's finished. That's how he was sanctified. And yet men will seek to pervert his words and to say that he blasphemes. Why? Because they see themselves as excluded. I hear some preachers say, well, I could never preach on election because that kind of gives the idea that some are excluded. But guess what? Some are. You just don't know who. No, it's election unto salvation. There's your hope. If God hasn't chosen sinners to save, one thing's for sure, there will be none saved. When Christ came, that's why he was sanctified to redeem, to sanctify, to justify those that the Father had given him. And so we have there the testimony of the scriptures. And that's why the Lord said, if you do not, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works. How can you go back and read all that this word and the scriptures declared concerning him and not see that he's nothing less than God himself? Believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. He didn't change his message. He didn't try to come around a different way. Like some preachers do. They think there's some back door just because there's opposition to preaching Christ and all his glory. Somehow you're going to bring him back to you not. Christ is the way, the truth, and life. None can come unto the Father but by him. And so even there, you see in verse 39, they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. Here is a clear picture right there. It's not Christ in man's hands. That's not a Jesus that the scriptures know. That's all men in Christ. He'll determine at what point he was to be taken and crucified and slain, but not man. But there's one final testimony I want you to see here in verses 40 to 42, and that's the testimony of those that did believe it. So you got Christ's testimony, you got the scriptures that testify, but the testimony of those that did believe in him. When, when you just read the verse 39, you think, well, then there was no hope. Read on. He went away beyond Jordan in the place where John had first baptized, and there he abode. It was John, but his former. And he was baptized by John, even his brother Bob read there in Matthew 3, that Righteousness might be fulfilled. How was righteousness fulfilled? Well, because that baptism represented his death, burial, and resurrection. That's why he went down the water. It was going to be through what that water represented. Christ wasn't baptized because he needed to somehow have his sins put away. Like some people think, well, you're baptized. For if that were the case, he would have been baptized. No, it was a testimony of his death and his burial and his resurrection. That's why it's by immersion. And many resorted unto him. That's the part I want you to see there. He went away, but all the while he was drawing out of that angry crowd those for whom he had been sanctified and set aside by the Father. And said, John did no miracle. But all things that John spake of this man were true. That's interesting. Some people think, well, you got to have miracles in order for people to believe on Jesus. No, John did no miracle. He had but one message. What was his message? Behold the Lamb of God. And here's the part I want you to see there in verse 42. And many believed on him there. The Lord knows those that are his. So yes, we have Christ's testimony. Yes, we have the testimony of Scripture. But how is this work to be done? It's going to be in those that Christ himself came to save. For whom he laid down his life. And their testimony. As I'm looking around here, I'm thinking of different ones that have testified to Christ being the Son of God. How is it that you make that declaration? I know it's only one way. The Spirit of Christ Himself. Putting that Spirit in you that you might declare, even though the world looks for another Jesus, but to believe on Him as He is, that truly is a work of grace. Oh, that the Lord would so teach us as he has all those that he came to save. All right. We're going to leave it there for now. Let's take our hymn books.
turn to in number 352. We'll stand and sing this together. Jesus, lover of my soul. Notice how it's put. It's his love for me. Jesus, lover of my soul. 352. Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly. While the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high, I be oh my Savior, I till the storm of life is past, safe into the haven guide. Oh, receive my soul at last. Other refuge have I none, hangs my helpless soul on thee. Leave, ah, leave me not alone, still support and comfort me. All my trust on thee is stay. All my help from thee I Cover my defenseless head with the shadow of thy wing. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Praise the fall and cheer. Heal the sick and leave the blind. Just and holy is thy day. I am all unrighteousness. False and full of sin I am. Thou art full of truth. Plenteous grace with thee is found, grace to cover all my sin. Let the healing streams abound, make and keep me pure within. Thou of life the fountain art, freely let me take of thee. Spring thou up within my heart, rise to all eternity. I heard someone change those words, grace to take away my sin. That's probably a better way to say it. It's important to discover, take it, put away. All right. We'll meet again soon. Lord be with you.